Our final guest on this month's show is Emory Professor Mark Bauerlein. Dr. Bauerlein is senior editor at First Things Magazine. He's worked for the National Endowment of Arts, and he writes regularly for outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the Washington Post, the Claremont Review of Books, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. In this interview, Dr. Bauerlein and I discuss his book, The Dumbest Generation. The subtitle is How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. We also discuss the current state of the humanities, uh, literary criticism, moral relativism, Christianity. We cover a lot of topics. Since it's a long interview, I'm going to skip the fluff and drop us right into the discussion as I ask Dr. Bauerlein about an increasing aesthetic and moral relativism among today's students. Enjoy the conversation. Do you think it's because their generation in general has rejected the idea that one can even have taste, that uh, aesthetic judgments are subjective and relative? Jordan, it is one of the most deep-seated prejudices now in college students today. The fact that when it comes to matters of culture and taste, we don't judge. We, we, we function as relativists. And we let people do what they want to do and enjoy what they want to enjoy. I give them the refutation of that attitude. I push it very hard in my classes. And... There are two points that I make to them. One is that the failure to discriminate between works of greatness and works of not so greatness is a failure to function as a fully formed grown up and in not making those distinctions, you're cutting yourself off from an experience of something so much better than the youth culture that you are all immersed in. That's one thing. The other thing is these judgments are made constantly. And the the idea that you live in this, you know, do your own thing, don't judge others, be tolerant, be open, that doesn't happen. And I had a perfect illustration of this uh, last semester in a freshman class when I was bringing this up. And the students immediately recoil from this idea. And one student was saying, I mean, it is just subjective. People like what they like and you like what you like just because you've been conditioned in certain ways. And we don't have any basis for making these distinctions between what, what I the example I gave of Shakespeare and rap music, rap lyrics. And uh, she rejected that. And then one minute later, we were talking about things, and I asked the students to pick things that they really thought were great in the last year. And one student sitting next to her says, oh, well, I, I think this movie. And the student who was pushing the relativist said, oh, that movie was stupid. There you go. That's a value judgment. (laughs) <laughs> so the problem with their moral and epistemological relativism is that they don't part of it is that they're they're hypocrites. They don't practice what they preach. I pointed this out in, in my last episode. They're perfectly willing to refer to rotten tomatoes and read uh critics' aesthetic uh criticism on films that so for example I said, you know, you're not going to go see a film that Rotten Tomatoes gave a 14% and you're perfectly willing to give an aesthetically based Yelp review uh online after you go to a restaurant where you didn't like the the how the food was cooked or how the service was or the atmosphere. You're perfectly willing to render your aesthetic judgments on on those topics, but when it comes to literature, when it comes to one's life philosophy, all of a sudden um, that disappears and one cannot make uh, objective, uh, or I should say, uh, aesthetic claims that are based on real criteria in the objects that are being held up for aesthetic judgment. Right. And it's impossible. It's impossible, you guys. Give me a break. Now, I think part of their hesitation 
to form judgments is when those judgments that they do form can be charted across any political incorrectness. So my example of Shakespeare and rap music sounds like I'm knocking African American culture and we don't go there. Anything that it can appear racist or sexist or any of the other isms that we're supposed to stay away from, that uh, makes them afraid. And the achievers that I teach, those who go to Emory University, where I am, they, they have learned that success comes partly by reducing risk, by not saying the wrong thing, by not getting into trouble, by not offending anyone. You keep your head down. You avoid controversial topics. That's what the achiever mentality uh, is about. And they've been told this either directly or indirectly out of their own experience. They know that there's a high degree of conformity in their world on all the sensitive issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, peer pressure has never been so high, partly because the digital age puts everyone under surveillance much more than they ever were before. And a digital mob is always ready to form if people cross those sensitive areas and and give offense. And aesthetic judgments can can be offensive, you know. Issues of taste can reach deeply into people. If you go out on a date and you go to a movie and one 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 hates the movie and the other loves the movie, that's a hard bridge to cross. And sometimes I think it's worse than politics, you know. Contrasting tastes are are harder to uh, to accommodate than uh, in contrasting politics. That's right. And and you know, it's something that my karate teacher told me years ago. He said, if I come over to you and I fix your stance, it's because I respect you and I think you can do better. Um, there's something in this, for example, it is taboo to criticize Black Lives Matter. Um, that is racist. You know, that that's the problem. If if it's taboo to make an argument about why Black Lives Matter is is bad, then that whole discussion is shut down. It's over. We you, know, you know, I have seen many instances, Jordan, in academia, in gatherings, discussions, when uh, people have done precisely that. Uh, I saw, for instance, uh, that that is shift the issue away from substance and onto identity. Uh, I saw once uh, a man give a critical lecture about a distinguished scholar, and he was solely focusing on the work. Well, someone in the audience said, you, you've attacked this person, and given that he is one of the first major figures to come out of the closet in American academia a couple of decades ago. Don't you think this really could be regarded as gay bashing? Oh, my goodness. This had nothing to do with it. And yet the speaker, he apologized. He said, I didn't mean any such thing, and I don't want to give anyone the impression that that's what this is about. He should have said... Uh, that has nothing to do with this. Let's get back to the issues here. Nope, nope. And everyone in the audience learned a lesson from that exchange, which said, be very careful what you say about certain people who possess certain historically disadvantaged identities. And the problem with that is that it's, it's hypocritical. Again, it's dehumanizing, right? It reduces an individual to uh, their to their identity group. And I thought we were trying to stay away from that. Right, right. Yeah, it's not the content of your character. It's, it's, your, it's your demographic. And that sums you up. And, and I want to say, what an impoverished way of addressing a human being. 
you have just erased all the individuality, the uniqueness of that person by these group categories that, again, are, are, are depleting human beings of depth, right? This is a very superficial way of looking at, uh, at others. But it's easy. It's easy, and all, all, the, uh, all the moral poles are in place, right? You know exactly where, where you can stand on, on these things. I, I, I don't care about these things anymore. I, I just, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm too old to, to bother with worrying about these niceties of, of not giving offense. So I want to shift here and, and maybe talk a little bit about what's going on in your discipline. You wrote a book called Literary Criticism and Autopsy, and you're talking about the cultural turn uh, in literary studies. And you're arguing essentially, uh, I'll read a description that I think maybe you probably provided to the um, UPenn Press. As the study of literature has extended to cultural contexts, critics have developed a language all their own. Yet scholars of literature today are so unskilled in pertinent socio-historical methods that they compensate by adopting cliches and catchphrases that serve as substitutes for information and logic. Thus, by labeling a set of ideas an ideology, they avoid specifying those ideas. Or by saying that someone essentializes a concept, they convey the air of decisive refutation. As long as a paper is generously sprinkled with the right words, clarification is deemed superfluous. And I'll just add one more thing. Bauerlein contends that such usages only serve to signal political commitments, prove membership in subgroups, or appeal to edit ed editors and tenure committees. Um, so it sounds like you're not so much making Harold Bloom's argument that critical theory or cultural criticism is, is an improper lens through which to view texts. You're not arguing that cultural criticism can't be done. It sounds like you're arguing that cultural criticism is being done poorly, um, and it's being done by people who are using, uh, who are equivocating and using language to obfuscate, so that they can propagate a certain political worldview. Yeah, and and the crucial element here was uh, productivity and competition. Over the course of the really the 19, 1970s and 1980s, uh, when more and more people were pouring into graduate school and the job market was shrinking, it, it became harder and harder to devote long years of homework, of study, of book reading without taking into account the institution. That is, without finding ways of branding yourself in certain ways, marketing yourself, uh, moving quickly through graduate school, speaking in a certain way to make yourself attractive to institutions who were hiring people. They wanted to see you characterize yourself. Are you theory or anti-theory? Are you a feminist? Are you a deconstructor? Are you a psychoanalytic? person? Are you a political person? What are your politics? In other words, the institutional, uh, the institutional characteristics and traits you could summon for yourself became more important than the books you've read, how much learning you have acquired, how much breadth you have. Are you able to teach a course in Shakespeare and a course in modernist poetry? Have you done your homework on things? No. What mattered is, can you walk into an interview and talk the talk? Can you seem conversant about contemporary trends? Are you up to date on the latest theories? And can you shift from them with flexibility and sophistication? Well, this became a very glib approach to demonstrating your your learning and it's I virtue saw signaling it, you, you, part of it was virtue signaling you had and it's just signaling you don't want to be too explicit about it but uh, in your in your language you would often then adopt cliches right institutionalized language language that had a pragmatic purpose 
again, of branding you in a particular way. Now, if that's what you have to do, you have to impress people, you've got to get a job, you have to show you have membership in the club. In the you've, got, you've got your union card. Yeah. Now, is reading all of the novels of Henry James going to help you with that? Is going into, if, if, if you're studying, uh, if, if you're studying um, uh, the, the modernist poetry of, of William Carlos Williams and Wallace Stevens, who were in, living in Greenwich Village for a t time in, in the second decade of the 20th century, are you going to go through the New York newspapers during those years uh, to get a feel for what daily life was like? For them as they were formulating their first modernist experiments are you going to do those kinds of archival researches well that takes a lot of time isn't it much easier just to master the lingo <laughs> right get the catchphrases get the hot terms clear and perform them in other words become an institutional performer not a person of great depth and learning. I was fortunate, and I went to a graduate school at UCLA that required intense learning and breadth. They flunked out a lot of people. We had hard qualifying exams. We had to take courses in eight historical fields. Now, you know, we had to do two languages. Uh, besides English. We had to do philology. Now we've, we've lightened all those requirements. We've tried to shorten the graduate school time. And uh, we have, as a result, made people work more about being practitioners of professional performance rather than people of great knowledge and erudition. And a literary historical sensibility. People who have what TSLA called the historical sense, right? A deep feel for the vibrancy of the past, that the past is still dynamic and alive for them. That is what, that, 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 that's why I called it an autopsy, okay? We were producing more people who were glib, but not learned. And they did well. Jordan, they got the jobs. They did well in the interviews. They gave the slick job talk when they were on campus. And they were the ones who succeeded. And I, I saw many of them, and boy, did I think, man, they were thin. But they, but they had a certain talent. If you're a lover of English prose, um, it just strikes me as being unimaginable that you would, that you would put yourself through that. I mean... Where's the sense of loving literature, um, like Bloom writes about? Um, I remember when I was a student, I ultimately decided not to get a PhD in English because I didn't think I'd fit in. Um, even though I had really good grades, the dissertation topics and the professor's specialties were just so odd and ideologically homogeneous that I honestly didn't think I could play that game. I love the literature too much. I just I felt like I'm not willing to spend a half decade learning about theories of oppression or intersectional feminist poetics or Walt Whitman's whiteness. It's like in order to be a, a, a PhD in English literature today, you have to be up on post-colonial studies and uh, transnational studies and and gender studies and new media and all of this stuff that seems to be just utterly devoid from what I imagine makes someone love literature, right? So I wanted to study 18th century literature, romantic poetry, Victorian literature. And I was told, okay, you can study those things, but only if you study them in the context of race, gender, oppression, colonialism, trauma, all of those things that are really hip. And I just said, I can't, I can't do that. I cannot do that. Literature and literary history became of secondary importance to most people who've gone into the profession in the last 15 or 20 years. What is more important is the identity uh, issues, uh, sexual identity, gender, uh, racial identity, uh, and politics, right? Uh, imperialism, 
and and uh, neoliberalism, colonialism, post-colonialism, disability studies is 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 very important now for many people. And in other words, these really social topics, uh, whether issues of social psychology or 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 sociology or uh, socio-political uh, issues, that is where the real motivation lies. Not that many younger people have that passion for uh, for Victorian poetry. That's not where the action is for them. It is one reason why the humanities have literary studies, including, uh, have deteriorated so much. And I mean by that in terms of their popularity on campus. Jordan, 20 or 30 years ago, you could not be a flagship university if you did not have a major English department. It's no longer true. Uh, we use the humanities, uh, you know, the foreign languages now only have one per make up 1% of majors in this country. Only 1% of students who earn a bachelor's degree major in a foreign language. Uh, English is now a little over 3%. used to be close to 8%. Um, The humanities now are increasingly window dressing on college campuses. All the action is in the the hard sciences and the business areas, the pre-professional areas. Uh, That's where the success of the university is, and that's where the smart students go. Uh, these days. And one reason is because how many students, how how many 19-year-olds would go into an English class, a basic English class, and start hearing about post-colonialism and be inspired to come back? I agree. So isn't the fault with with you folks, with with the mentors, with with those of you who are passing down the tradition, with the administrators? Like, I don't really blame them for not majoring in English because I've, I, I, I had to sit through these English classes, and for example, we took, I took a course called uh, Literature and Psychology, and we spent the whole time deconstructing Freud using people like Deleuze and Guattari, and the whole thing was well, a... What, what level was this course? It was a 200-level course. Um, well, like it, sophomore level? Yeah, and it was, a, it was a grad student who was almost done with his PhD, and we spent just the whole time deconstructing... Uh, Freud in this really resentful, vindictive way. It is utterly irresponsible to assign sophomores uh, Deleuze and Guattari. That's a book, the anti-Oedipus book, I presume. That is a book deeply enmeshed in French psychoanalysis of the mid-20th century. It doesn't make much sense if you haven't worked through the French Freud, as as it was called, that would be like uh, someone bringing in the the very advanced uh, concepts of topology into a freshman algebra course. I mean, there has to be some seek some some well in in education they call it scaffolding that makes these works make some sense. And you know, cases like this of a graduate student getting in there and doing his dissertation with these students who are 18 and 19 years old, well, I, I no wonder. I imagine a lot of kids in the class were just shaking their heads and saying, what are we doing in here? Uh, and it's, it's, it, it is. It's not going to bring people into the major. People are going to come into literary studies and come back if they can be inspired, if they have fun, if it's meaningful to them in a personal way, that doesn't mean dumbing down the literature. No, that doesn't mean trying to make personal appeals. What it does mean, though, is to read Macbeth and to make Lady Macbeth really come alive. You know, when Lady Macbeth is sleepwalking at night, and and they're watching her out damned spot. That's you right. Know? Out damned she, spot. She she concludes by saying, well, "What's the exact line? Who would have thought the old man, man had so much blood so in much him? Blood in him. Yes, that's a creepy line 
today. <laughs> That's right. That's a shocking statement. And she's she's again she's she's sleepwalking there. A, a teacher should be able to have students see that and hear that and say, "This is real stuff," and I want more of this kind of thing. I want more of human life and meaning and death and honor and dishonor and love and jealousy and passion and betrayal and villainy. All of the things that the humanities can present, and most of all, beauty and sublimity. A sublime experience is one that sticks with you for the rest of your life. Can we enact that? For students, they'll come back. But, again, the goal of enchantment is not the goal of my colleagues. What they want is for the students to engage in political enlightenment, which is to say, I want, I want them to, to realize what I realize about, about the world. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awful. <laughs> um, these are the things that you're talking about are universal human themes. They have nothing to do with um, uh, I, identity markers that are given to us at birth. They are just universal themes that everyone can identify with. And I feel like that's what we're getting away from, and I'm really sad about that. Yeah, and I, I, I think the humanities will continue as, again, a niche field. I don't think the political side of it is going to be very successful much longer. Because the political side only kept people excited if they felt like it was having an impact. And as they see fewer students coming into their courses, fewer majors, people coming in and signing up as majors, as they see fewer people reading humanities scholarship, most of these books and essays are published and they disappear and are never heard from ever again. Right. So libraries just buy them, basically, and, and they're never cited. Most of them are yeah. never cited once. Yeah, and I think that libraries even themselves are going to start saying, can we just get a PDF copy? No one ever checks these books out. We don't need the books. And they're very expensive to keep, to buy and to main, to keep. Uh, they take up space. Uh, we'll see if we come back to the inspiration side of the humanities, the enjoyment that students have. But we will need to get professors who have the formation, which isn't happening. And I don't know if it can happen because of the, the sort of group think that's happening within, um, within, you know, English departments, you know, given the adamant emphasis that universities place on diversity, it seems that they could care less about the most important kind of diversity, that being diversity of thought. I wrote for a blog called Heterodox Academy. I don't know if you've heard of it. And their whole mission is to stress the importance of viewpoint diversity in academia. Uh, one thing, though, I, that I wish they talked about more is how the absence of viewpoint diversity leads to the entire nullification of certain disciplines within English literature, for example, and the neglect of whole avenues of inquiry. Um, John Haidt has talked about things like how there's really no good military history programs anymore. But I'm interested if you have anything to say about, about that. Are there areas in English that have completely fallen by the wayside? You, you certainly find certain, uh, certain areas and issues overlooked. For instance, uh, the American literature through up until and into the 20th century was profoundly influenced by American religion. The, if you read the Psalms... In King James, you will hear these lines echoed everywhere in American literature over and over again. How many American literature teachers in the academy, oh, young ones, we'll say, are steeped in American religion? Most of them are thoroughly secular people, or if they are religious, they confine their religion to Sunday. It doesn't inform their work that much. I mean, I, I only had one teacher ever tell me how important the Bible was. And I, I did work in American literature, 19th century American literature. So I, I feel like I, I, I had a big gap 
in my education. And part of that is the secularization bias that professors have. And that's bad education that took place uh, right there. That's what I see, what I see in, in the humanities, uh, that uh, the emphasis on liberal secular outlooks really keeps a lot of historical materials off the syllabus. And writers, you know, I, I remember uh, going through graduate school and all these theoretical works would, would come out. And we were reading uh, Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida and all the prominent figures there. But it left a whole range of, I'm going to call it cultural theory, untouched because it was aligned with forms of conservatism. For instance, uh, the work of Friedrich Hayek, the libertarian economist, mm -hmm. social thinker. Uh, he has a couple of very philosophical works that touch upon cultural matters, like the counter-revolution of science. Very important, sophisticated work. Never heard a word about it, even though Foucault was a great fan of Hayek, said this must be read. Uh, I don't know if any humanities course taught Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and The Last Man. Because that was a neoconservative document. But Hegelian, so... It, it, it starts with Hegel, and it ends with Nietzsche. So it's right in the line of continental thought that Foucault lies in. I had lunch once with uh, Jean-François Lyotard, one of the leading figures. He, and this was in the mid-90s, he said, this book is the most important book of political theory that has come out of America in the last three decades. So there you have one of your own highlighting this book. Now, the only times I ever heard that book mentioned in all my years in the humanities was in a curt dismissal of it. No one ever said a word about the substance of the book. They just dismissed that book. So there's an example of certain ideas, contents, books, and traditions simply being expelled from consideration. They don't argue against them. They simply ignore them. I read uh, an article that you wrote about the Amy Wax situation, and, and you sort of made the same argument that um, her defense of bourgeois values, um, the people that sort of uh, ganged up on her weren't even, didn't have anything to say about her argument. It was just a sort of, you know, superficial ad hominem attack the whole thing right they, they just wanted to condemn her they didn't want to uh argue with her and you know the really appalling thing about their letter uh in response to amy wax's argument that much of the social dysfunction in america is the result of the abandonment of bourgeois norms of behavior uh, about marriage about public conduct about respecting authority, delayed gratification, Protestant work ethic, all, all those old-fashioned things. Mm -hmm. They jumped on her, uh, particularly the phrase when she said all cultures are not equal. And she held bourgeois culture up as a better formula for success than, say, inner-city gangster culture. She's uh, absolutely right about that. But they... They attacked her for that, and then they said to students, if any of you, in this open letter they wrote, if any of you uh, are running up against bias here at Penn, you come talk to us. In other words, they're just inviting students to turn into tattletales. They're telling them, instead of just shrugging off something that irritates you, let's, let's go ahead and run with it. If you're taking a, if someone says something offensive, you act on it instead of just shrugging it off and going about your business. No, this is the invitation to young people to continue thinking of themselves as adolescents. You know, the heterodox academy people, the first things to say is you have to have a thicker skin if you're going to live in a free society. We have free speech. People are going to annoy you. 
you just have to shrug it off and and move on that's the cost of the first amendment we have to have a little bit of a thicker skin out in in public life so you mentioned the just earlier you mentioned the um the catholic or religious element in in literature and and how that was being sort of put by the wayside um I went to your Wikipedia page, and I was struck by a passage that said, in 2012, Bauerlein announced his conversion to Catholicism. He has self-described himself as an educational conservative, while he socially and politically identifies as being pretty liberal and libertarian. Um, so I want to ask you, um, shifting here a little bit, what do you mean by educational conservative? Um, I imagine as a teacher in the English department at Emory, your, your educational conservatism probably makes you a rare breed, does it not? It does. I mean, I, I, an education conservative believes that there are great books, mm -hmm. that uh, tradition is a value, mm -hmm. and that uh, no student should be encouraged to adopt a critical or rebellious, challenging position until that student has immersed himself in the tradition that he aims to undermine. In other words, you got to know all the bunk before you debunk. Please, do your homework. <laughs> so that, that's an education conservative. Um, I am actually quite socially conservative at this point that's an old statement i don't know who made that wikipedia page mm -hmm. but uh i i become quite socially conservative and religiously conservative as well in in the last few years and one reason for that is that i see where political liberalism social liberalism has gone in the last few years it has gone deeply into identity politics it has become highly illiberal. <laughs> and my feeling is that this is not an abandonment of liberalism. It is, in fact, the logical extension of liberalism. That we were never going to stay with Martin Luther King's colorblind vision of universal humanity, all of us equal in the eyes of God. Nope, we were going to break up into identities. It, it, was, it was going to. The temptation would have been too strong. And liberalism had undermined the institutions that kept us from doing that, such as churches, right? Uh, that liberalism had uh, set about, in one way or another, to make the family a more fragile social unit with policies such as no-fault divorce. And the fact is that when... You have children who grow up in stable families. They're not going to be the ones who take quick offense at things. Children who grow up in strong families with fathers around young men are not going to. Uh, they're they're not going to be so fragile and and resentful over what other people say and do. They've got a stronger constitution. They can handle things more. It's kids who come from brittle families that they're particularly inclined toward illiberal behavior. So this is one reason why I've become much more socially and religiously conservative in recent years. And also I see liberalism has become not uh, the freedom of the individual to stand firm against blunt authorities and dead traditions and conformity it is it has become a hammer to coerce people to get in line with all the politically correct outlooks that's where where liberalism has gone in 2017 I suppose it depends on what you mean by the word liberal. I mean, I don't see how you can argue with the fact that uh, single motherhood is the greatest single predictor of intergenerational poverty. That's a fact. 
Um, and, and then what do you have demographic wise? You have the, the black single mother rate is over 70%. The Hispanic, uh, single mother rate is over 50% and the white, uh, single motherhood rate is somewhere over 30%. We're in trouble, aren't we? The problem with talking about that is that feminism will not allow it. Feminism does not want to say that single mothers are uh, inadequate. Uh, remember that liber- this is where liberalism really has become an outlook for the top 20%. If you are in the top 20%, by far you tend to form stable families you don't get divorced. You do get married before you have kids. And you have all the habits of delayed gratification and work ethic that lead to success in, in college and in America today. You can exercise enough prudence on your own so that the impact of the sexual revolution doesn't hit you so hard. You protect yourself better. Well, the bottom half of America doesn't. The sexual revolution was very good for upper middle class women who wanted to have careers. It's very good for them. The sexual revolution has been a disaster for working class and underclass women. Would anyone doubt that? Can no, not, not, not that? even the Brookings Institute, the left-leaning that. institute. They said that oh. if you want to avoid permanent poverty in the United States, you had to do three things. You had to not have kids out of wedlock, um, get a job, and um, uh, graduate high school. <laughs> but look, liberals who occupy that top 20%, they have to deny it because it's worked for them. It's been very good for them. They can be professionals. You know, mother and father, they both work. They, they have good jobs. They raise their kids in careful ways. They, they raise their kids with bourgeois norms. <laughs> um, but they refuse to uh, present their own lives as examples for everyone else to follow. They will not say that it is very bad that 17-year-old black men have no fathers around to teach them how to be grown-ups. They'll think it. They'll say it privately, but they will not say it publicly. They know that the riots in Baltimore were the result of social pathologies in that area, not of racism. But how could it? How could it be racism? The you know the the wasn't the the black, the city council a majority black? The police force majority minority in that case. The the uh, the mayor wasn't the mayor black and 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 the you know and, the, and, and there have been hundreds of millions of dollars poured into that area in government programs in the last thirty years, and yet the Obama administration spoke about this in terms of lack of access and opportunity. I mean, they were speaking as if they were still in 1971. Uh, so they, they, Jordan, they can't give up that 1970s liberal outlook on social issues, the sexual revolution, uh, and, and, and so on, because their, their entire position would collapse. I mean, their t- entire personal position would collapse along with their political philosophy. They would have to admit, yeah, it's been very good for me. And that's not what a liberal wants to say. A liberal wants to believe I'm thinking of others, hmm. not myself. Hmm. So it, it's, it's something they will never admit. So it seems like a lot of your political consciousness has evolved along with your religious uh, evolution. I wanted to ask you, you were, you were an atheist for most of your life, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and I want to know what motivated your shift um, 
uh, and your your religious identity. And was it a was it a transcendent well, uh, I, I, experience? Was it a question of lack of meaning? Was it an intellectual development? What what led to your uh, move towards religion? Well, I, I was I was born baptized Catholic, uh, but you know had my had my uh, my atheist conversion as a late teenager, and stuck with that for a long time. I don't think that people go through two conversions. I think that's pretty much impossible. So I went through one, and that was my conversion to atheism, and it, it hit me within a few minutes, uh, that experience. Uh, the return to the church uh, to faith really was a slow realization in middle age that there was something wrong with my atheism, that it actually was more of a psychological response to my circumstances as a teenager than it was a, a genuine revelation of the truth of things. That, in combination with having a son, having a family, and thinking to myself, I don't want him to think of uh, of the world as absent God. And not because it will make him feel better, but because I just felt deep down there's something wrong here. Now, he can make up his own mind when he's 18, but he's going to go to church until then. And he takes to it quite naturally. And I do think that children uh, accept very easily on faith the the presence of God. It's so easy for them, and I, I find a wisdom in that. It sounds to me a little bit, I'm going to challenge you here, push back a little bit, it sounds a little bit like argument from consequence, the fallacy, where if I don't like the, if I don't like the outcome of something, therefore it's not true. Um, or if I don't like the outcome of something, therefore it is true. Either that or Pascal's wager. Um, explain to me how it's not. I, I, I would. I, I mean, it may be a fallacy of of consequence, um, but I, I I I would say that the consequences of a belief uh, that if if you are troubled by the consequences of a belief that that is worth taking into account. In, when we're talking about metaphysical matters, not empirical matters, right? We have to follow the facts, mm -hmm. the information, mm -hmm. the data, the evidence. Yeah. Uh, but in metaphysical matters, when uh, we're always going to be seeing through a glass darkly, that the, the consequences and the different kinds of consequences are, are actually uh, somewhat valid. I mean... In a way, it's it's like the 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 cosmopolitan atheist, the sophisticated, learned figure, who isn't anti-religion. He just simply believes that it's not true. But who thinks that religion is good for civilization? <laughs> Religion's good for society. Now, they would say that there would be an example of consequentialism that would have a degree of cynicism in it, although they would really believe that it is good. That's me, by the way. That's I, me. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I, I would say that they, in this case, don't give the consequences their full due, that there may be something more about why mm. religion is good for people and good for society. Mm. But I don't, I don't pretend to make strong philosophical arguments about ab about this and and i i i somewhat want to leave it alone in in i mean in my, in my own head um because i know that my instinct going back to this this atheist conversion is is to tear it all down and i still have that inside me uh those 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 doubting voices and i don't want to listen to them I think they're wrong. Even though they're there, I believe they're wrong. So I, I have a certain mistrust for, for my, own, uh, my, 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 own, my own deep psychic disposition. 
these things. So how has your life changed since this conversion? I'm, I'm genuinely curious about this. How has it changed how you see the world? How has it changed maybe the way that you parent? Uh, well, one, I, I think that when you settle into this kind of thing, you, you acquire a certain degree of moral courage, right? I'm not afraid to stand up for what I think is right, even though it usually means being outnumbered and despised. I mean, I, I get, you know, the periodic hate mail for things I write, mm. but it doesn't matter. I'm going to maintain uh, what, what I'm doing. Um, so that's one thing that comes with it. Um, another thing is the, maybe you, you, you feel a little more, a stronger feel for the past and the future, not just the present. Uh, where you you do slip more easily into that famous contract that Edmund Burke talked about, where we owe a debt to the past and we we must pass the past on to the future as well through our kids, through our work um, that you have you have more consciousness of things that lie outside the present. This is the 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 other thing that I would say and there 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 is. A, a certain groundedness mm. that you have when you go to church every week and you you have your rosary with you. There is a, a place to go that is out of the world, and that I find pleasing. Mm. It's nice to leave the world once in a while. <laughs> As a lover of literature, I can attest that that is true. <laughs> um I want to switch over to The Dumbest Generation for a little bit. Uh, in the book, you argue against those who would claim that the internet is a panacea for young people. You argue that while the internet is the greatest storehouse of knowledge in human history, I saw this in your uh, Phi Beta Kappa uh, video, students aren't using the internet this way. They, they aren't using the internet this way, uh, contrary to what uh, the, the technocrats would claim. For the most part, they're not as your critics would make it seem, sitting at home examining old maps and documents and going to the National Geographic website, or they're not on their iPhones at Starbucks browsing through documents or museum collections. They're basically using social media. They're just talking to other young people. Um, now, I assume that since you wrote the book, the frequency of internet usage has increased. Um, but has the tendency changed? Are, are, are kids going on the internet and using social media, or, or has there been some, some movement there? Are kids spending their time on the Smithsonian or uh, PBS websites? Has any of that changed? It doesn't seem to me to be so. I'm with kids every day. The, the, no, the movement has changed. It's gotten much worse. Uh, we have more social media now than we did in 2008. Twitter was just starting uh, about when I was writing that book, Facebook had only been, it, it had really, it had really launched, what, in 06, it really started to, to spread. Uh, so the social media is, is much broader than, than it is now. There was no Instagram or Snapchat uh, back then. Um, but this was inevitable. What do, what do teenagers care about? They care about other teenagers. They care about what other teenagers want to look at. So they've got celebrity sites and, and, and pop music and youth culture through, uh, through, through the social media and sharing among themselves. It's a peer pressure medium for, for them. They, the, the intellectual impact is clear. They are writing more words than ever before. Mm -hmm. Has has writing improved among young people well the sat added a writing exam in uh, a writing component in 2006 and scores have gone down every year except two years when they were flat uh reading scores on the sat are at their lowest in 40 years uh we haven't had any bump in reading on the nape exams in spite of the millions and millions and millions of dollars that have been poured into reading instruction after No Child Left Behind in particular. And we don't see any gains on the NAEP scores in civics and U.S. history. I mean, they're, 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 they're not more knowledgeable than they, than they were before. We see no intellectual 
gain at all from the digital age. It hasn't happened. And the good thing is no one is claiming it anymore. They were, the, the, the hype was very powerful in 2000, 2001, 2, 3. No one is hyping this anymore as, as the digital age bringing an extraordinary flowering of intellectualism and knowledge among, among the rising generations. That's over. And, and, and it's a relief, at least, that we don't have to listen to that. No, but you do hear them say, look, IQs have been going up. And, and besides, uh, these young people, they're not the dumbest generation. They're just uh, applying their intelligence to different problems and exercising their faculties through different channels. And they're, they're right. the most tech-savvy generation, and they're changing the economy. And they, they may not know the facts that you and I want them to know, but, but they have other skills. They're, they're great at multitasking, and they're forward-looking, and their facility with social media is, is, uh, is bringing about limitless potential. It's connecting the world. What do you say to, to these people who make this Well, well for, first, the, the, the rising IQ scores, that phenomenon that ran through the, the 20th century, uh, that looks like I've seen recent reports that that's, that's slowed down quite a bit. Also... Uh, in areas of IQ that are measured, you know, IQ scores are composites of nine or ten tests. One of them is vocabulary. We've had very little gain in vocabulary, uh, apart from more people going to college. That has improved vocabulary. That wasn't the Internet. It certainly didn't, didn't do that. Uh, do, does anyone think that the comment rolls and Facebook pages have high vocabulary? Anyone's going to learn anything from those? No, not, not at all. Um, information IQ, that is how much you know about the world, that's barely budged. Uh, so the more culture heavy the IQ test, I mean, the less abstract, you know, like uh, the abstract reasoning, spatial reasoning and things like that, uh, the less we see any, any IQ gains. So People don't have any more knowledge than they did before to, to speak of. Where they have done is they, because more schooling, they have gotten better at abstract problem solving. So they're more accustomed to the kinds of uh, abstract challenges that IQ tests pose. That's, where, that's really where the gains uh, come from. Now, they're going to college more than they did before. They're getting more degrees than ever before. But whenever we have tests of actual knowledge and thinking development, boy, are the results disappointing. First of all, great inflation. In 1960, only 15 percent of college grades were A's. Today, it's 45 percent. Now, do, do we really think that college students are, are you know, that much smarter than they were back in that? No, the scale has changed. We've raised the, the uh, or we've lowered the bar, I should say, than much, much more than we did before. Um, when they look at how much critical thinking, problem-solving gains happen from freshman year to, to graduation, it's very disappointing. This was the topic of the big 2011 book, Academically Adrift, which so that some one-third of students make hardly any gains from freshman year to senior year. Uh, the, 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 most of them don't, don't make any significant gains beyond that. Uh, when, when they do get some gain, it's, it's, it's very little. And boy, they're paying a lot of money for it. And then ask employers about college graduates, and they're going to start screaming about how poor their verbal communication skills are, their writing skills, their reading skills, and not to mention their soft skills of uh, how to conduct themselves mm. in, in the workplace. You know, the, 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 the numbers aren't there. Now, people don't like to say that because they don't want to criticize the kids. They don't want to sound like a grouchy old man. They don't want to make judgments about our culture, our society. And so they, they put on the rose-colored glasses, but they're wrong. But we need to be the grown-ups. We... Uh, go ahead and say I'm a curmudgeon, but we need to be the grown-ups. Sorry. Kids want us, to, and they want us to be grown-ups. They do. They want to hear the truth. I mean, at least give them something meaningful to rebel against. 
instead of this uh, soft and you know I love the kids you know they I I, I, I really learn more from them than they learn from me oh, please if that's the case then you shouldn't be paid <laughs> um, uh, you, you shouldn't be at the podium um, uh, one, one of the things that surprised I, me I, I actually think that they are starved for uh, teachers and mentors who can be a little more stern with them and tell them the truth I think so too and I work in an urban district uh, at an urban high school and you know my my colleagues I think view me as as one of the stricter teachers and I and I say I think that's what they're craving they're not they're not yes. get, they're not getting the structure at home they're not they don't have anyone at home to correct their grammar they don't have anyone at home to to show them culturally important works or works of of real value they don't have anyone at home to speak with some sort of intellectual authority to them, I feel like I'm doing a service. You are. <laughs> you are. I mean, for, for some of them, I imagine this is the only place in their lives where they have some, some rational, predictable challenge and support. I mean, maybe this is the only place where they, they, they can escape a lot of emotional chaos at home. That happens. Uh, so you are they, they want you to be this. This is what I what I what I assume. I do too. I do think that they're open to this, and maybe a lot of it has to do with the idea of age segregation. I saw that you did a TED talk on this, and I'm going to give you a quote by Senator Ben Sass. I read his book, The Vanishing American Adult, and it was very good. I don't know if you read it. Um, he he was, gets it right. Yeah. He gets things right. Uh, he was yeah. talking with Peter Robinson uh, from I think it's Uncommon Knowledge. And he said this, and he, and he wrote this in his book too, we're raising 15-year-olds that spend almost all of their time with 15-year-olds and 19-year-olds that spend almost all of their time with 19-year-olds. That's really weird, historically. Nobody has ever done that before. He says, basically, that if you brought people in a time machine from 300 years ago to 3,000 years ago, anyone in that range, and dropped them into today, one of the main things they'd think is really strange is that we live almost entirely age-segregated lives. So what accounts for this age segregation? Why is it happening? And what are its consequences? Yeah, it, it actually goes back before the digital age, but the digital age has certainly amplified uh, the age segregation factor. Now... When I grew up still, yeah, the kids would hang out in the neighborhood and you get some vast, you know, five, six, seven year age differences. And that actually was a good thing uh, to relate to people of different age groups from from yourself. When it's only your own age group, there's this there's this kind of false equality uh, that that you can have. And it doesn't teach you things. If you if you're 12 and you're playing with an eight year old, you have to be a little more responsible. If you're 12 and you're playing with a 15-year-old, you have to try to act a little older than you are. This is good. This helps you. Both cases help you mature. If 12-year-olds are just with 12-year-olds, you can just be exactly what you are and not worry about it, not think about it, uh, not feel you have to take care of someone else or that you have to obey someone else. And, and I think that that, that uh, does hinder the development of maturity is social media at fault. I mean, you you can't it help helps. you can't help but blame social media when when they come home and it maybe uh, formerly it had been the case that kids would have to hang out with their parents or or right. they would go in their rooms and read a book. Now they're going on social media, even when right. they're around their parents, they're using social media while their parents are talking to them. Is it goes media on all, all day, all day and all night. It it goes on. I mean, they they, they run about thirty five hundred text messages a month, you know, to go along with all the other, all the other social media uh, stuff. And it does allow them to really age segregate. I mean, really year. I mean, only one or two years difference now between uh, between groups. Uh, and again, this. Uh, is a it's it's a failure to form a more diverse set of relationships that would help you help you to grow up. It also separates you from adults in ways that was never true uh, in in the past. This is a great social experiment. 
of kids growing up with more influence from one another than from, from any adults in their lives.